was looking out of my living room window one night when I noticed a fox on the front lawn. The lights in the house were off, so I was in darkness. And there was a street light shining down on the fox. He was spotlit. I have the impression of being at the theater, so I take a seat and begin watching the show. The fox sits down, stands up again, turns a circle, scratches an ear, but then heads purposefully in the direction of my rubbish bin. You know the rest of the story, don't you? Now, I've known about this neighbor of mine for quite a while, of his love of yogurt and butter, of his preference for cooked meat rather than raw, of his sweet tooth, of his inability to distinguish between the dining hall and the toilet. A neighbor of mine was over the fence one morning with one of these. They had all sorts of ways to keep the fox away. He was manically spraying his garden, like so. Misting the roses, I ask him. No, he replies, not exactly. I'm spreading lion dung. A blog describes the foxes as public enemy number one. A national newspaper reports that there are 30,000 foxes in London alone. Another paper says the foxes are getting bigger and bigger and more deadly. Now, there's a backstory to this hysteria. Foxes in Britain have been hunted for hundreds of years. Fox hunting has been a national sport. But now, now things are changing. In East London, a fox climbed through an open window and bit two sleeping babies. Now, at a consumption rate of two babies per fox, and with a fox population of 30,000. How many of babies is that at risk? 60,000. That's in the space of just one night. Imagine the fallout after a whole year. Within two years, the human consequences are unimaginable. The local authority, the government, has advised people to keep windows closed at night. Home improvement stores are selling electric fencing. You can even hire the services of a sniper. But are snipers and electric fences really what we need? Do we really want to get rid of all the foxes? What happened to opportunism? What happened to the power of the imagination, to invention, to curiosity? Surely, buried somewhere in the inconvenience of this urban fox, there must be pleasure to be had, a lifestyle to be discovered. Surely, this adversity can be turned to some kind of advantage. Now, they say the night is a time when instinct and intuition take over from logic and reason. That's what happened to me on the night that I saw the fox on the front lawn. That's when I knew what to do about this troublesome character. I'd civilize him. I'd give him culture. I'd show him art. My fox was to begin his aesthetic education by completing an obstacle course. A bag of rubbish or the bin would be placed at one end, and to reach it, the fox would jump through a series of cubes. Surely, I thought, an encounter with these clean, honest, and very rational forms would encourage these qualities in the fox. But I quickly realized he'd cheat. Foxes have a bit of a reputation for cheating. He'd be like one of those people who goes to an art gallery but finds the art boring, so heads straight for the chocolate brownies in the cafe by the exit. Fortunately, by this stage, the project was a team effort involving another artist. And we put our minds together and soon came up with, Richard and I, to a, a new project, something that would educate the fox in quite a different way and would help him the fox was going to climb a tower, a building. Not any old building, but one specifically conceived to inspire new ways of thinking and behaving. This is a drawing of it by the original architect, Vladimir Tatlin, done over 100 years ago. And it's known as the Monument to the Third International. Here's Tatlin's model that he made. 
Interestingly, he made it with found materials, which we thought the fox would appreciate, as he never pays for anything. Now, sadly, Tatlin's final piece was never realized, but we now had a chance to put that right by building it ourselves in my front garden. We'd worry about the planning permission later. For in our view, this dangerous design was exactly what the fox needed. If only he could get to the top of that precarious tower, he'd be lifted from his smug suburban lifestyle and get a new perspective on the world. Or so we hoped. Here's our model. It's more modest in scale than Tatlin's, and we took a few liberties with the design. One of these was to place the restaurant at the top. That's the strange-looking pod that you see with a hole. This would give our client a rooftop view, and so when filled with fish heads and congealed curry and so forth, would be the fox equivalent of at least a three-star Michelin restaurant. And here's the completed tower on my front lawn. To be clear then, we were going to leave the meal in that yellow pod at the top, and the fox would come along at night, and he would walk up that spiral walkway that you see um, going up to the top round the edges. And here it is on a winter's night at about 3 a.m. Here's the fox learning all about art. He seems to be making quite an effort. He's obviously quite a capable and very willing student. Why didn't we think of this earlier? Think how many foxes we could have kept out of trouble, how many youths we could have kept off the street. If only we could have left those windows open all along. But it's not quite the end of the story, because what this video doesn't show is that it took the fox many nights to take an interest in the tower. He'd come into the garden regularly enough, but then he'd sit at the base of the tower, he'd lift his nostrils to the pork chop that I'd served in the restaurant, and then he'd head off again in the direction of the takeaway. We spent many nights waiting, long, cold, very boring nights, and as we did so, we came to realize how much we cared that the fox visited the attraction that we had built from him. Until he stepped onto it, it was meaningless. It was like a light that nobody turns on. And so, consequently, we came to see, too, that it was not we, the artists, who were in charge of the situation, but the fox. We were at his mercy, and we found ourselves indescribably grateful when he God did what we asked him and climbed the tower. But when he finally agreed to do this, he did it too strictly on his own terms. He would often get on, go halfway up, and jump off again just for fun. Look too how he declines to follow the spiral walkway that we've lovingly created for him with all those colored planks, preferring instead to weave his own way through the center of the scaffold. So it was that the fox turned tables on us, and before we knew it, was teaching art and culture back to us. You're human, he seemed to say. Get over it. Turn adversity to advantage. Enjoy the night. And if you want to learn about the world, don't work. Play. Thank you.